This story begins in an office, where the protagonist works in the advertising department of the company Big Glory. What a name for a company, right? Sounds like a magic card name. The protagonist is one of those people who live solely for work, and his boss threatens him, saying the company is laying off a lot of people, and he needs to make an effort. The boss even gives him a list of potential clients to call. Despite being very tired, the protagonist starts typing until something strange happens. A strange image appears on the computer computer screen and everything starts to distort. When his coworker asks if Howard is okay, the protagonist, with his hand over his eyes, takes a moment to respond but says he's fine. Howard's coworker reminds him not to forget that they have dinner with the boss tonight. It might sound nice, but the protagonist thinks it sucks because in the end, they have to split the bill, and for him, who earns pearly, it's not worth it. His coworker notices that he's not into it, and offers to lend him some money. Seriously, what a great coworker. He mentions that the new director will be introduced today, so they can't afford to miss it. And speaking of her, look who's coming. Her name is Sabrina Luo, and as she passes by, the guys are all dumbstruck, and the protagonist says that this woman is out of this world for someone like him. A few hours later, everyone is celebrating and socializing with their co-workers, everyone laughing and eating peacefully. But the protagonist starts to have the same problem he had at the office, and his iris starts turning blue, and suddenly his nervous system was connected to some kind of system, and an image above him that only he could see. And the image begins to say, Of course they can't see us. Star Universe Limited strives to bring the best experience to its customers and achieve groundbreaking innovations based on virtual reality. We calculate and design for all sensory organs, including your mind. That's why we are capable of silent communication. But the protagonist, not understanding anything, says he never bought anything virtual reality related and doesn't have money for it. But the image continues. You will be the tester of our specially made dreamland, where you will have many different life experiences. Think of it as the high-end version of a VR game. Throw in flashbang! The protagonist, like any other softie, says he doesn't want any of that and that he has to go to work tomorrow. So the robot tells him that the system is capable of taking a copy of each person from real life and if he wouldn't like to live life as a different person. But before the protagonist can respond, his boss arrives with the new director Sabrina to introduce her. The boss introduces her to the employee who's the biggest suck-up he has. When it's the protagonist's turn, the director asks him his name, and he starts to introduce himself, but is interrupted by the boss saying he's nobody and that he has mediocre skills. But in reality, it's all a lie because we see that the protagonist was indeed very skilled but didn't suck up to the boss, so he resented him. Then the director says she understands and leaves with the boss. The protagonist's colleague feels a little sorry for him. When it's time to leave, everyone starts saying goodbye. Howard is upset saying he worked so hard but wasn't recognized. His friend tries to console him saying that to be recognized you just have to suck up to the boss. But in a flashback we see that this guy was a leader defending students back in school. And the protagonist says that now he is totally different from what he was before. He succumbed to the system. Then the boss appears telling the director she doesn't need to waste time with the insignificant ones. But she doesn't pay much attention to him and says she knows what she's doing and the protagonist overhears everything. The boss realizing he heard gives him a hint about people who deserve to be fired. Howard gets angry and says he'll resign tomorrow. But to calm him down he asks the system to send copies of the boss and the director to this dreamland. Errors in the instructions, the system, can only scan one person at a time based on the requests made. The system determined that the target to be scanned will be Sabrina. The protagonist is caught off guard and the robot says the scanning on Sabrina is complete. When Howard gets home he gets mad at the robot because it didn't say before that it could only scan one person at a time. The system detected a strong increase in dopamine in your brain. The conclusion is, you're loving it. Howard is embarrassed by the truth thrown in his face. But he's not wrong, who wouldn't want a hot woman as an NPC in their game? The robot says the system will be activated at midnight, so the protagonist needs to find a safe place to sleep. Howard says that's easy. The problem is he's too nervous to sleep, but the robot says it was expecting that and will interfere with the part of his brain that activates sleep and will make him sleep. Then the system starts and Howard starts seeing things as his heart races, but he falls asleep. And in the blink of an eye, he wakes up on the ground, and right in front of him is a woman with cyberpunk-style leg bands. 
The woman introduces herself as AI-63, an artificial intelligence and administrator of the Dreamland system. Howard is somewhat confused, and the woman explains to him about a shop system and credits where he can buy things that might be useful in the future, such as a knife that costs 2 credits, a truck that costs 40 credits, a temperature-controlling jacket that costs 20 credits, a food package that costs 1 credit, or even an infinite energy battery costing 200 credits. The woman explains that as he completes challenges, he will earn points, and he asks if he has any NPCs he can use. She replies that with 10,000 points she herself would be at the protagonist's service. She informs him that the dreamland is about to begin, and if he has no other questions, to prepare as a portal to an apocalyptic world has opened in front of him, and he is sucked into the portal. But he wakes up in his bed, so he wonders if what happened was real or not. However, as he woke up at home, he believes it was just a delusion on his part, and goes to take a shower to go to work. But the bathroom has no power, so he changes and goes downstairs from his building. When he steps onto the sidewalk, the street is strange with debris and empty vehicles. He also doesn't see anyone nearby, but he starts to hear a noise that gets louder and louder until suddenly, an out-of-control plane appears and crashes right in front of him. The plane explodes and the protagonist is thrown away but manages to survive by hiding behind a car. The Mimic Dreamland Doomsday Survival has started. What would you do to survive if all the people in the world suddenly vanished? The difficulty level is zero. You have 180 days to fight this battle. The protagonist doesn't stay in shock, saying, What do you mean, 180 days? But as Howard complains, the sound of liquid dripping sounds in his ear, and when he crouches down, he realizes it's gasoline leaking from the car. Another explosion throws him once again. A little while later, and the protagonist, feeling a bit calmer, comments that another plane crashed into a building after the incident we witnessed. And because all the people in the world disappeared, things like this can happen. He's making a list of supplements he considers essential to survive. And since he has 180 days, he'll take the opportunity to have fun, playing loud music on the street, dressing however he wants, and doing whatever he pleases. He also remembers that Sabrina was supposed to be in this world too, but he hasn't found her yet. The protagonist hears something and looks back to see, but it's just a dog passing by. However, the problem is what's coming behind the dog, none other than a tiger. It lunges at Howard, and to the surprise of both the protagonist and myself, it's friendly. It seems that now that there are no more humans, it escaped from the zoo and has always been raised among humans. So it leaves, and the protagonist is amazed at how detailed this game is. Howard starts having difficulty finding water, and without power, the food starts to spoil, and now there are worms everywhere. Without food, he won't last long. While he's carrying water in his car, he takes the opportunity to loot a restaurant and finds a generator along with a freezer with fresh meat. Now he can make that his shelter. During the day, he loots places, and at night, he plants seeds and fertilizes them with the rotten food. The guy is a genius, but after these 31 days, loneliness starts to mess with the protagonist's head. He starts seeing his friend inside the car with him saying things. Anyone who watched, I am legend, will get the reference. The protagonist says the city has turned into a dump and there are flies everywhere. And at night, he feels worms crawling on his body. He's going really crazy. Suddenly, a light shines on his face, and he breaks abruptly, spinning on the road and hitting none other than Sabrina's car. She finally appears, and now Howard will have someone in place of his mannequin. Sabrina wakes up not knowing where she is, notices that someone has bandaged her, and she's wearing men's clothing. When she leaves the room, she notices the diesel generator and a fresh meal on the table. She finds Howard shaving. After all this time without seeing anyone, he must want to look presentable for her. Howard says he cooked for her and invites her to eat together. She reveals that they already knew each other and asks his name. He introduces himself as Howard Chin and thinks the game also managed to copy her memories. Sabrina is impressed with everything he has done, the electricity, the food. He just says he was lucky and asks how she spent this time. She says everyone had disappeared, and he is the first person she has met since then. Howard asks what her plan is from now on, and she says she still doesn't know what she's going to do. So, he suggests that she move in with him. If she gets sick, she would have someone to take care of her, and they could live much better there. Without a better choice in this world, she accepts the offer. But right from the start, she makes it clear that he's not her type, 
and she wants to keep her distance. The protagonist is incredulous at what he just heard from her, but as the only interaction they have is with Donald, the mannequin, he accepts her terms. Sabrina explains that she won't take advantage of him and they can share tasks. He says it's a great idea and that they should sleep because they have a lot of work to do the next day. Even without saying anything, he didn't feel good after being rejected by the girl. The next day, Howard wakes up to a loud noise and wonders what Sabrina is doing. He leaves the room and sees a bunch of boxes scattered around, so he asks her what she's doing. She says she's going to use the warehouse as a bedroom, and if he needs her, he can ring the bell. This makes him very irritated, but he controls himself and asks where the mannequin is. According to her, the thing was too scary, so she threw it away. He says she should have asked first. The mannequin was like his Wilson, the only friend he had all this time. In memory of Donald the mannequin, the best and only friend we ever had. Sabrina says she will fetch the mannequin if it's so important, but Howard leaves angrily, saying he'll do it himself. After everyone disappeared, he took some weapons from the police station and put them in a box. And on the first day with the girl, he noticed that a pistol had disappeared. Howard returns to talk to her and says it's better for each of them to wash their own clothes and make their own food, so they'll see each other less. She won't have to be alert all the time, and he won't feel strange when he sees her. Sabrina says that as a woman, she has to protect herself, and even though she's beautiful and rich, he won't be a gentleman just to make her feel good. He really hasn't gotten over her throwing away his doll. He also says that even though he's not a gentleman, he won't hurt her. Three months have passed, the weather is getting colder, and the foul smell has dissipated. Sabrina is tending to the garden. Thanks to her, they now have vegetables to eat. They've hardly spoken since their first fight. She didn't seem to mind, but he can't bear the loneliness. So he talks to the mannequin as if it were a real person. He tells the mannequin they'll look for meat today, asking if they might get sick from eating spoiled meat from the market, or if they could eat rat meat but might die if there's a virus in it. Fortunately, he decides to try his luck fishing. Before going, he visits his other friend at the zoo, who happens to be none other than the tiger, surviving by eating other zoo animals and what little the protagonist brings him. Suddenly, the tiger behaves strangely, running towards some deer nearby. Howard notices that the zoo deer have no antlers, so these must be wild ones invading the city. Heavy rain begins with thunder, and strong winds. The protagonist realizes it's not just a storm but a typhoon approaching. He rushes to the car, asking the mannequin how a typhoon could have formed so quickly, then remembers he's in a game, and the typhoon must be part of some challenge within it. Howard also remembers that Sabrina is out biking in the mountains, and must be near the top by now. He drives back home hoping to find his only real company in this world but only sees the pots she was caring for. All destroyed, the door wide open, and he starts calling for her. With no response, he heads towards the mountain. The typhoon worsens, and he finally finds her. The girl is leaning against a pole, and something happened. She has a serious injury on her leg. She asks if she's going to die as the protagonist carries her. With a serious look, says that's not going to happen. They take shelter from the rain in the mountain mansion. Sabrina is all wet and trembling from the cold, and Howard asks to take a look at her wound, as stubborn as ever, refuses. He angrily tells her she'll end up dying if she keeps it up, but she continues to refuse help, saying she can take care of herself. Howard reveals he has a plan for the situation. Since they don't know how long the typhoon will last, he thinks it's best they move to the mansion, which is higher than the shelter. They need to gather things from there as quickly as possible and bring them to the mansion. As Sabrina is injured, it's better for her to stay in the mansion, and Howard warns her to avoid being poisoned by the smoke from the fire, leaving her irritated for being unable to do anything. The typhoon only grows stronger, Snow even starts to fall, and it's amid this weather that the protagonist leaves the mansion and heads towards the shelter. Upon arrival, the place is flooded, and since the water isn't electrified, the generator has also stopped working. Howard tries to retrieve the vegetables they harvested, but a rush of water and wind carries most of them away. They find themselves in a tough situation, with enough food for only two meals, 
And in the midst of this, fishing or even resorting to rats is impossible. Frustrated with everything that has happened, the protagonist seeks advice from his best friend, the mannequin. With no answers from it, he heads towards his other friend, the zoo tiger. He finds the tiger covered in injuries and asks the tiger to help him hunt. The protagonist says he'll take care of him and tries to get the tiger into the car. But the tiger ignores him, sitting only at the zoo gate. Howard gets irritated, as if he were talking to a person and not an animal, and the tiger responds with a roar. He tells himself he shouldn't care so much about a game, accepts the tiger's decision, and heads to the car, leaving the tiger sitting alone in the middle of the typhoon. Howard is returning to the mansion, trying to sort out his thoughts along the way by conversing with the mannequin. When he arrives, something catches his attention. He stops the car, and Sabrina is lying on the ground. She explains she tried to fetch water to boil for them but fell and can't get up. Naturally, this irritates Howard. He carries the girl to the mansion, leaving her surprised, gives her a slap on the buttocks to scold her, and she yells, saying he'll be making decisions from now on. He throws her onto the bed, telling her he'll fetch the first aid kit, and she better not pull any tricks while he's gone. She screams she can take care of herself, and Howard retorts he's not pleased to have to help her, having enough problems of his own. He needs her to heal quickly to be of any help, or they'll starve. He tends to Sabrina's wound, and she asks what he plans to do now. He reveals he'll try to hunt the wild deer that started invading the city after everyone disappeared. The girl warns that if the deer caught his scent, they'll always be on alert when he approaches. He ponders on this for a moment, saying it doesn't matter much since they have weapons. Speaking of weapons, he found the pistol that had gone missing under her pillow when he went to get supplies at the shelter. He returns it to Sabrina, who asks if it wouldn't be better for him to keep the gun. He says he'll leave the weapon with her as a gesture of trust and bids farewell, needing to prepare for the hunt the next day. It's been 121 days since the game began. The mansion is covered in snow, and the protagonist is preparing for his first hunt. He thinks the deer must be in a suburban area slightly below the mansion, and now feels pressured by Sabrina's words. Having never killed even a chicken, the protagonist isn't confident he can kill a deer. As a precaution, he's also taking some fishing nets. Unbeknownst to him, he's being watched from afar by a pack of wild wolves. Howard arrives at the hunting spot, and the cold is bone-chilling. By the noise, the deer are nearby. He quickly turns, runs towards the sounds, and prepares to shoot, but once again the animals have fled. He's lost count of how many times this has happened. Every time, Howard hears the animals close by, rushes to them, and loses their tracks. He recalls Sabrina's words. It's as if they know all his moves, and he's just wasting time. Tired of the hunt, he heads to a river to try fishing. The current is strong due to the storm, but he's desperate for food and casts the net. The current starts pulling the net, and he tries to hold on tight because it's his only net, and he can't afford to lose it. Suddenly, the net is pulled with great force and he can hold on. Howard is dragged into the middle of the river and falls into the freezing water. The protagonist emerges from the freezing water, trembling with cold, thinking only that he needs to get back home and warm up before he dies of hypothermia. But he spots a deer right in front of him and hides to not be noticed. He can hardly believe it. This is the chance he needed. He searches for the rifle but, unable to find it, he'll have to make do with a shotgun. He aims at the animal, takes a deep breath before shooting, but when he fires, the recoil is stronger than expected and hits his face. The shot hits the tree beside the deer, which manages to escape. Now, in addition to almost freezing, he's also injured his face. Feeling stupid after losing so many resources and getting injured, he wonders if he'll end up starving to death. At that moment, he hears a noise and turns around. Behind him are some wolves, and he grabs the shotgun in case he needs to defend himself, but they realize they might get shot and leave. The protagonist finds it strange that they backed off but decides it's better not to waste more supplies. Howard returns to the mansion and enters the room. Sabrina is warming herself by the fire, seemingly wearing only a blanket, and she She's surprised when the protagonist starts undressing. After all he's been through, he just wants to warm up a bit, and she says, embarrassed that he didn't need to take everything off. Amid his clothes, she sees a photo of the protagonist with a girl in his wallet. Sabrina asks if the girl in the photo is his girlfriend, but the protagonist says she's his ex-girlfriend. She continues to be curious and asks why they broke up. He explains that he wanted a family, but the girl wasn't ready for that, then asks if she had someone before everyone disappeared. Sabrina says yes, her boyfriend was a doctor from MIT 
and the head of a big company. Howard finds it surprising that such a talented guy had such bad taste in women. This time, she turns irritated. How could he say that about her? He's left speechless, and she realizes she was rude and apologizes. Unaware, the blanket falls, and her breasts are exposed. She yells for the protagonist to leave the room, and he leaves, thinking about the wonderful sight he just had. The next day, the protagonist goes after the deer again, but all he manages to do is see them from afar. Whenever he tries to get closer, they disappear. It's understandable his difficulty. Besides having a short-range weapon, he had never held a real gun in his life. He keeps trying, without success. Days go by and at least Sabrina is talking more with him. She also doesn't complain about him coming back empty-handed from the hunts. The girl is getting weaker every day, and her wound also shows no signs of improvement. Howard tells her that he set up a trap, using stakes and some leaves to lure hungry animals. Sabrina says it was risky because he is already very weak after all this time without eating and, indeed, according to him, this trap will decide whether they survive or not. The next morning, the protagonist goes to check on the trap. Unfortunately, it's empty, but right in the corner, he sees some drops of blood on the stakes and rushes to follow their trail. Running, he begs for the deer to be dead. He desperately needs something to eat. Howard follows the tracks to a clearing and realizes he's too late. The wolves are eating the flesh of the animal that had been caught in the trap. Desperate, he grabs the shotgun and starts firing towards the wolves. Without hitting any, they flee carrying the meat. The protagonist falls to his knees in the snow, even knowing he's in a game. He can't hold back the frustration of having failed and starts screaming in despair. The game is on day 126, and all that's left for the couple to eat is a tomato and a cabbage leaf. Sabrina says it didn't help at all, so he better eat what's left, and he asks her to stop being so proud because they're both going to end up dying anyway. Sabrina looks at him thoughtfully and begins to recount how she lived being controlled before the age of 18. Her father would lock her in the room and dictate everything she had to do. Unlike her siblings, she couldn't go out or have dreams. Because she was a woman, her father said she would one day leave the family just like her mother did and the only way to bring honor was by obeying him. Without the family's power, she was nothing. Now the protagonist understands a bit why she's so proud. Howard says they've all been through tough times and even though they always try their best, they're never rewarded. Maybe it didn't even make sense for him to try so hard. So Sabrina wants to know if he has any skill that makes him stand out. According to him, his skill is never giving up once he's decided to do something. For her, there are many people who work hard, but unless they have something that outshines everyone else, it won't matter. Her strength lies in being independent, and the protagonist will only know his after making an effort to do something. He asks if he'll be recognized by her if he helps her survive. It seems all he wants is to be recognized for doing something. Sabrina says she'll lose her independence if she keeps receiving his help. But since they're going to die anyway, she could be kind to him at least once. She ends up relenting, and he takes the remaining cabbage to eat and staggers out. Before going he says if he doesn't return in three days, she'll find his body near a stream and in that case, she'll know what to do. The girl is left alone in the room, trembling after hearing this. The next day, Howard tells the mannequin about the conversation he had with Sabrina. Now he is willing to do things differently, no longer going to just whine and blame others for his weakness. If he had made this decision earlier, he could have changed things both in real life and in the game. Howard looks at his mannequin friend and pushes his companion off the balcony, symbolizing a new beginning from now on. We see a feminine hand holding a cleaver. The hand belongs to Sabrina, who is standing in front of a body on the ground. It's Howard lying there, and Sabrina is about to slice her companion. She strikes, and suddenly wakes up startled. It was just a dream. This is the first time she's dreamt in three months, meaning, since the beginning of the game, Howard's words have truly weighed on the girl, who is afraid she may have to take drastic measures if she loses her companion. The game is on day 127. Howard throws a shovel into the snow. He's tired and almost out of breath. The protagonist is at the lake where he fell before. He remembers that was the only time he managed to approach a deer without being noticed. Probably the water mast is sent, and this time he seems to have a plan to get close to those animals. After that dream, Sabrina is afraid to go back to sleep. Without eating or sleeping, 
she begins to hallucinate her father. He says she wouldn't go through this if she had followed the path he chose for her. The girl screams at the illusion, and it disappears, at least this time. Sabrina holds a tomato, the only thing she has to eat, and remembers Howard, asking her to acknowledge his hard work, at least once. She promised she would wait for him for three days, and there's only one day left for him to return. Even if he doesn't come back, she is determined to survive. Sometime later, she wakes up again. Now there's a damn rat eating her tomato, she's too weak to get up, and the illusion of her father returns laughing. And her father keeps asking what she will choose, we find out that the boyfriend she claimed to have is, in fact, an old man near death that her father arranged for her to inherit his fortune. Her father says it's shameful she can't endure a little pain, she's just a woman pretending to be strong when she's actually pathetic. In the end, she'll be eaten by rats without being able to do anything. If the illusion is like this, imagine the guy in real life. Back to Howard's plan, a deer appeared and is calmly eating the leaf the protagonist had picked up. In the room, Sabrina aims at her father, she says she doesn't need his help, or anyone's. Her gun is reflected in the rat's eye, and the shotgun in the deer's eyes. After burying himself in the snow to conceal his scent, Howard is very close to shooting the deer. He hits the shot. At the same time, Sabrina also hits the rat squarely. The downed deer lies in the snow, and the protagonist begins to emerge from his hiding spot. With a penetrating gaze, he touches the deer and starts laughing shouting excitedly for having successfully bagged his prey after so much sacrifice. Meanwhile, Sabrina is eating the tomato and roasting the rat she caught, victorious. Howard opens the door, bloodied, carrying the deer, and notices his companion eating. She seems surprised, and the protagonist is exhausted, losing his strength and collapsing. Sabrina gets up to help, and as she tries to lift him, she notices eyes clinging to his clothes. The girl slices the deer and prepares a warm bath for Howard, who remains unconscious. She is worried about his condition when suddenly he grabs her hand and begins whispering her name. Unable to understand, she leans closer and hears him ask if he has earned her recognition. She was about to complain, but she stops and says that he's amazing and that they wouldn't survive without him. The protagonist laughs, finally hearing some kind words from her. He remembers how his ex-girlfriend once told him before they broke up that he was worthless and his hard work was pointless. Poor guy just wanted to be recognized by someone. Sabrina prepares a soup with the deer meat and calls Howard to eat, but he is still very weak, trembling with cold. Feeling obligated to feed him, Sabrina opens his mouth and starts feeding him mouth to mouth, which is quite bizarre. Even with several blankets, Howard continues to shiver with cold, and Sabrina finds herself without alternatives. She resorts to her last resort. The girl begins to undress, stripping completely, then lies down next to the protagonist, embracing him from behind, saying that everything will be okay. Howard wakes up and realizes he's not alone in bed. He turns and sees Sabrina lying next to him. Sabrina asks if he's awake, and he holds her hand, wanting to cherish the moment a little longer, and says he's still not feeling well. She begins to talk about his ex-girlfriend and asks again why they broke up. Howard says she thought they were too young for anything serious, and the girl wants to know about the other reason. Howard thinks for a moment, and says he wanted to have a family. Out of nowhere, Sabrina says she wanted one too leaving him speechless. As she wants to be an independent woman, he doesn't understand this desire to have a family. According to Sabrina, that's precisely why. Wanting to be independent is just a goal she set for herself, and the closer she gets to it, regardless of anything else, the more she becomes trapped in her own choices. She asks how she can claim to be independent if she can't even make a choice on her own, and the protagonist doesn't know how to respond, as he never set goals in life. Now she asks if Howard would like to have a family with her, and this fool is stuck, unable to respond properly. Properly. This leaves her embarrassed, saying she should have thought better before saying something like that. He holds her hand trying to fix the situation, and says he also wants to have a family with her. He just couldn't believe that despite his failures, never being recognized, someone would want to have a family with him. Now they have a reason to survive, and finally, after 130 days, they kiss. The protagonist also manages to do a few things for the first time. Right in the middle, Sabrina remembers being gagged by her father, and him saying it's time for her to enter the adult world. Her father says this is her final lesson, and a couple enters the room. He instructs them to do it on the couch, and they start undressing. Sabrina is forced to watch as they do what you're thinking. The sicko of her father wants her to watch to learn and do it with 
with the fiancé he arranged for her. The guy reveals he's not even her father, and from now on, he will change her name to Sabrina Luo just to make them appear as father and daughter. Coming out of the memories, Sabrina says she'll have more appreciation for the protagonist from now on, and lies on his chest. He still can't believe what just happened, especially that a woman like her was still a virgin. A month has passed since they became a couple, and it's been a great month for the protagonist. He hasn't fully recovered yet, but he's able to work again. The deer meat ran out, and with the river frozen, they managed to drill holes and go ice fishing. Sabrina started building a greenhouse to grow vegetables, and it's almost ready. Howard hears Sabrina calling, and the girl says she has a present for him, which gets him all excited because he thinks he'll get a kiss from her. Instead, he receives a deerskin poncho, which helps disguise the smell and makes hunting much easier. On the way back, he remembers the night of the typhoon when he found Sabrina clinging to a post, and he never imagined they would become a couple. A lot has changed in his life since the beginning of the game, and he decides to visit the zoo. He starts calling for the tiger, bringing a deer leg for him. Maybe the friend is still around. Howard hears a roar and runs through the snow to find his tiger friend. Exhausted from running so much, the protagonist sees his tiger friend being attacked by the pack. He shouts at the wolves, who look at him and he shoots, trying to drive them away from the tiger. The wolves flee, and the protagonist says it will be okay. Then he realizes the state the tiger is in. It's too late. He's badly injured and won't last long. Howard caresses his head, remembering the happy moments he had with the tiger, and apologizes for being late. If he had arrived a little earlier, he could have saved his friend. The tiger looks at the protagonist, who is about to end the tiger's suffering. He says he'll miss his friend and, swearing revenge, he shoots. The protagonist seems disheartened, even while in the bathtub with Sabrina, and she notices. She asks if something happened, but he doesn't mention the tiger or the wolves, only stating that it's getting colder and more dangerous, and he asks her not to leave the mansion in the coming days. She agrees, mentioning the remaining work to be done in the greenhouse, and asks him to be careful outside, who once pitted himself for lacking love, now that he has achieved what he wanted, refuses to let those wolves take away his happiness. He will do whatever it takes to keep them away from their home. The wolves run through the snow, attempting to catch a deer. Despite the agility of their prey, the wolves hunt in packs and coordinate their efforts to capture prey that cannot escape. After catching the deer, they call out to the rest of the pack, and as they run to eat, Howard, disguised in the deer's poncho for camouflage, shoots and hits one of the wolves, which falls agonizingly into the snow. Without mercy, the protagonist takes a hunting knife and finishes off the wolf. In the middle of the night, the protagonist wakes up, seemingly disturbed by the ongoing conflict with the wolves. Sabrina notices that something is amiss. She remarks that he seems distant and asks if something is wrong. However, fearing that she might find out about the wolves, he simply embraces her, reassuring her that it's nothing important. Although still somewhat suspicious, Sabrina remains silent, while the protagonist contemplates that there are still three wolves left. The next day, the wolves sense a threat and run to hide, and the protagonist is after them again. One of the wolves runs toward a bush and, as it approaches, sees another hidden wolf there. It runs toward the other wolf, and a shotgun barrel enters its mouth and fires. The others become alert after hearing the shot. Emerging from the bushes is Howard, wearing the deer's poncho and the skin of the wolf he had killed the previous day. The protagonist seems determined to annihilate all the wolves mercilessly. The two remaining wolves wolves look at him from afar, surely also seeking revenge for their lost companions. The game reaches day 170, and it has been 10 days since the protagonist began hunting the remaining wolves. He is practicing his aim while thinking that he hasn't found any traces of the remaining wolves. He knows he can't be reckless, or he'll lose to the wolves, but only after eliminating all of them will he be able to have peace again. Howard hears Sabrina calling for him. She says they are going to have fish and roasted meat. Now she seems like a happy housewife with her culinary skills. The protagonist tells her that he will be traveling for a few days and won't be eating with her tonight. This guy doesn't know how to appreciate what he has. Sabrina looks at him with pity and says that he's hardly ever home. She asks if Howard is so busy that he can't even have dinner with her. Howard apologizes but says he has to finish some things to be at ease and walks past her. Sabrina, holding back tears, 
wants to know what could be so important. Since Howard is sure she wouldn't let it go if she knew about the wolves, he insists that it's nothing and leaves Sabrina behind, crying. Three days later, she wakes up to a noise. There are boards outside the window. The noise she heard was Howard nailing them up. She goes outside and asks what he's doing. He says the cold is getting worse so he's reinforcing. Sabrina says she never asked him for protection. Howard thinks she's joking and asks if there's food ready. She starts speaking seriously, saying he's treating her like anybody else instead of his partner. But he's stubborn and says she's wrong, adding that everything he does is to protect the house. Sabrina gets very angry and asks what's really going on, why he doesn't tell her anything. He falls silent and then says she can't help with what he's doing and to stay home. She becomes sad and just leaves quietly, while he plans to go to the hardware store to get nails. He puts on his camouflage clothes, saying the temperature keeps dropping, then drives his car to the store, lamenting fighting with Sabrina. In the store, the protagonist is looking for the tools he needs and happens to find, on a shelf, a diesel generator maintenance manual. He'll be able to use the generator again. Suddenly, the store's TV turns on by itself, catching Howard off guard. AI-63 appears, greeting him. She reminds the protagonist that there's only one week left for the game to end, shocking him. He must have forgotten that this reality had an expiration date. At the mansion, Sabrina sticks a note on the door and leaves with a suitcase, giving one last look before leaving her house, and we see the note she left, saying they both need some time apart, and asking Howard not to follow her. At the tool store, the protagonist broke the TV. He must not have taken the news of the game ending well. When he turns to leave, the wolves appear, and the protagonist says he understands why the wolves are angry with him. The wolves start to approach the protagonist cautiously. Both know the danger they're facing. Feeling cornered, the protagonist runs out of the store, trying to get to his car, but his leg still hurts. He hasn't recovered from when he was buried in the snow. He's caught by the wolves, who knock him down and bite him. The protagonist manages to tear away the deerskin poncho that the wolf was biting and throw it away, then grabs his backpack to fend off the other. With the hunting knife, he manages to strike one of the wolves, but is bitten by the other on the back. He turns to defend himself and hits the wolf's head, but his knife breaks. The wolf seizes the opportunity to bite the protagonist, but receives a kick to the chest. Even with the broken knife, Howard attacks the wolf, which can't get up. With the knife handle, he starts beating the wolf until it stops moving. The protagonist grabs the bag and staggers away while we can see that even though very injured, the wolf is still alive. He remembers desperately asking if that world would continue to exist after the game ended. He wanted to know what would happen to Sabrina, wanted to stay there with her. He completely lost sight of the fact that all of that was just a game. The wolf struggles to stand up and bites Howard's hand. The protagonist says the animal really wants revenge, but that won't happen because he needs to protect Sabrina even if he doesn't end up with her. Meanwhile, Sabrina is driving somewhere. The protagonist tries to get into the car, but he's being attacked by the two wolves. He keeps trying to get in, and Sabrina's gun falls out of the glove compartment. He doesn't know how the gun got there, but at least now he has a chance to defend himself. He shoots and manages to scare off the wolves. The protagonist gets into the car, and the only thing he can think about is fixing the generator. He needs to give Sabrina a chance to survive at all costs. The oil tank is frozen, and Howard can't start it. He's very weak, and the wolves are waiting outside for him. Weak and tired, he passes out. Howard wakes up in a bed with his wounds bandaged. He asks Sabrina how he got home, and she says she found him with the broken car and brought him back. She thought he was dead when she found him. The protagonist wants to know if there was anything around when Sabrina found him, but she only found the bag he was holding. The wolves must have fled before she arrived. Upon hearing about the bag, he remembers the generator and tries to get up, but Sabrina stops him because he's still badly injured. Nevertheless, he doesn't stop and tells her that this is the last thing he needs to do. Sabrina gives in. She knows he won't listen anyway. In the garage, Howard focuses on fixing the generator, and his hard work pays off. Now the whole house is illuminated, and he seems proud that he succeeded. The protagonist shouts to Sabrina that they have light now. She is in the kitchen cutting meat, and doesn't seem excited about his accomplishment. Howard goes to the mansion's entrance, 
and notices a parked car. He wonders if this is the car Sabrina used to bring him back to the mansion. The car is damaged, with the airbag deployed. Something must have happened when Sabrina saved him. The protagonist approaches the car coughing. The wheels seem to be dirty with blood, and Howard finds a wolf's canine stuck in one of the tires. Surely Sabrina dealt with those wolves. Howard stands up and feels dizzy. He bends over, leaning on the car, coughing heavily. When he looks at his hand, he sees he's coughing up blood. He knows that if he doesn't find a doctor, he won't live much longer. Looking at the dent in the car, he imagines Sabrina must have hit a tree. Maybe he didn't realize the girl squashed the wolf with the car against the tree. He takes another look inside the car and then looks towards the mansion. He must have understood what really happened after he passed out. On the clothesline, we see two wolf skins hanging. In the mansion, the protagonist embraces Sabrina, thanking her for everything she did for him, and asks for forgiveness. She doesn't seem angry that he hid the story of the wolves and says she's making a wolf stew. He asks her to make a good dinner because they have a lot to do in bed, especially since the guy is coughing his guts out. The game only has two days left, and the entire city is frozen. Sabrina looks out the window and tells the protagonist that the storm has passed. He doesn't seem well, and she gets worried, asking if he's okay. He really looks awful and says he feels exhausted. Sabrina thinks it might be a cold and looks for medicine for him in a drawer. But the protagonist calls for her, saying it's not just a cold, the guy is dying. His words alarm her, but she tries to be positive, saying he has gone through many hardships since the beginning of the storm. It's a shame that an employee like him isn't recognized. If they were in the company, she would nominate him as the best employee of the quarter. And he thanks, almost powerless, his lovely boss and wife. Sabrina says she hasn't accepted marrying him yet, and hands him a glass of water to take the medicine. Howard is so bad that he can hardly hold the glass. Before Sabrina could help, the glass falls to the floor and breaks. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on upcoming videos. Leave a like if you enjoyed it and share with your friends. See you in the next video. Bye for now.